Well, it sure sounds like the tone around New Orleans Saints cornerback Marshall and Lattimore sure has changed, and it sounds like good news for fans hoping that he'll be in the black and gold again in 2024. We got all of that and a little bit of land yap for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdet Nation and Houdet family? I'm your host, Ross Jackson, New Orleans native, your New Orleans Saints expert and credential member of the media covering those New Orleans Saints as a senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, we're looking at three big takeaways from General Manager Mickey Loomis, along with his time with some of New Orleans media at the NFL League meetings. We're going to take a look at Willie Gay's potential impact and how exciting he is as an addition and what it could mean for the New Orleans Saints through the lens of Mickey Loomis. We're also going to take a look at whether or not the New Orleans Saints are finally starting to get right when it comes to the salary cap. But to kick us all off here, tone seems to have changed quite a bit around Marshawn Lattimore and the, I'm using heavy air quotes here, potential trade of the star cornerback here in New Orleans. And it sounds like good news for New Orleans Saints fans, at least for now. Let's get to that here, and we'll get to all of that as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. We appreciate you very much, as always, making us your first listen of the day. And of course, for being an everyday or here on the Locked on Saints podcast, proud part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On for $20 off of your first order. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed over at Game Time. Man, it sure does sound like things are going and trending in the right direction when it comes to the New Orleans Saints and cornerback Marshawn Lattimore. Assuming you're on the side of the fence that says that you want Marshawn Lattimore back in 2024, which again, as I have continuously said, I think is the right choice for the New Orleans Saints. And for Marshawn Lattimore, just simply if we're being honest, um, we'll see where things go. Obviously, things can change at any moment. Uh, any team can end up making any offer that ends up changing a team's mind. But before we get to my thoughts on all of this, let's listen to what Mickey Loomis, New Orleans Saints general manager, had to say when he was asked about whether or not the cornerback market impacted the team's dealings when it came to the idea of trading or not trading Marshawn Lattimore. And a great question. For Matthew Paris over at NOLA.com. Here was uh, Mickey Loomis's response. You know, nobody's made an offer we can refuse on any player, so you know, that's I don't have any, any comments on So, not really a lot going on in that response outside of like, hey, feels like things are just kind of status quo when it comes to Marshawn Lattimore. Didn't talk about anything having to do with any kind of deal, didn't talk about anything, didn't even really give like, I mean, he's obviously not going to come out and say, yeah, you know, we've talked to some people and things like that, uh, but didn't really even have the kind of response that says, hey, look, yeah, our options are open. We wanted to give ourselves some flexibility, the kinds of responses that still kind of leave a door open. And while this response doesn't close the door entirely, like we just mentioned, anything can happen. There's two interpretations of what Mickey Loomis said. And so either when he said, no one has made us an offer that we can refuse. He either meant that as it was, which we'll discuss here in a moment, or what he meant was the usual turn of phrase, which no one has made us an offer that we can't refuse, which is to say that, hey, maybe some teams have called, maybe they haven't, but if any have called, there isn't a, uh, you know, an offer that moves the dial enough to convince the New Orleans Saints to move on for Marshawn Lattimore. And when you consider the recent trade that just happened with Legereus Sneed, who was just traded to the Tennessee Titans, uh, yeah, that would make a lot of sense because that trade return wasn't big for the Kansas City Chiefs. They swapped seventh rounders with the Tennessee Titans and they earned a third round pick in next year's draft, which seemed always to be that that would be the case in terms of a trade for Marshawn Lattimore because the Saints are unlikely to trade him before June 1st. And they're unlikely to trade him after the first week of the season because that's when his option bonus sets in. So there's this neat little time throughout training camp, basically, that you're looking at the possibility of trading Marshawn Lattimore if a trade were to happen. But for a 2025 third round pick, now seeing that that's what the Legereus Sneed trade was, eh? 
I don't think you're going to do that, right? Like, it doesn't feel like a trade that you would want to make for a guy that has been your top cornerback. And I understand that he's been off the field considerably over the course of the past couple of years, but on injuries that to me don't seem like injury prone conversation injuries. Um, so yeah, very likely if the top cornerback in this year's sort of movement class here, movement class, like I'm right back in theater all of a sudden, uh, but you know, in terms of the class of, of top corners that were moved over the course of this offseason and really over the course of recent offseason, you look at the Jalen Ramsey trades and stuff like that. Just didn't feel like a third round pick a year from now was going to be enough for the Saints to go. Yeah, that makes sense. You know what I mean? And so with that being the case, yeah, you didn't get an offer that you can't refuse. That makes perfect sense. Now, if he meant exactly what he said, which I'm inclined to believe, right? Mickey Loomis is a smart human being, right? So I, I, there is the other piece here where he meant exactly what he said was that no one has made us an offer that we can refuse, meaning that literally no one has even made an offer. It still tells you the same thing that the trade market isn't there. And so if the market's not there, why force the issue? Just patch up whatever you need to patch up. If there is any kind of rift, get it taken care of. As we've mentioned over and over again, you've heard it here. You've heard it with John Hendricks and I speaking over on Second and Saints as well, which by the way, shout out to John Hendricks for sharing the video since he's over at the owner's meeting with me still here in New Orleans going to the Louisiana Pro Day later on today. Um, he was kind enough to share that. So I want to make sure I give him his props. You could check us out Tuesday night as well. Tonight over at Second and Saints, we'll be live. Uh, but I mean, with everything there, like it just feels very much like this trade isn't going to happen. And I'm really cautious about saying that because again, anything can change at any time, right? So I can sit here and tell you here on March 26th that yeah, the New Orleans Saints aren't going to trade Marshawn Lattimore, but I would never say it that matter of fact, because you never know when it comes to the NFL. You never say never when it comes to the NFL. And you certainly never say never when it comes to the New Orleans Saints who have made surprising moves in the past. But right now, if I had to gauge a barometer out there, if I had to give a percentage, it sure has crept now from me thinking like, man, this might be like 70-30 that Marshawn gets moved just based on what we were able to infer, not imply, but infer from the... Um, from the, the restructure and the option bonus later on being pushed down the road and all these other things, like those things feel like you're setting up for a trade. That kind of felt like 70-30 that he might get moved. And then kind of as time went on, it was like, ah, oh, it might be more like 50-50, y'all. Like it doesn't feel like they seem to be like really in a hurry to get this done. And that might be impacted by the trade market of some of these other corners. And then now that we're beyond that point of the trade market of some of the other corners being set in, it feels like it's kind of 70-30 the other way that Marshawn Lattimore is going to be a New Orleans Saint in 2024. Now, again, I'm not saying that matter of fact. I'm observing sort of like if I had to put a barometer on it, because again, anything can change at any time. The right offer comes through, a bad situation occurs, whatever it might be, and everything can change. So I'm not going to sit here and tell you, hey, Marshawn Lattimore is going to be a New Orleans Saint in 2024. Excuse me, keep hitting my microphone. I'm not going to tell you that, you know, uh, yeah, no, for sure, he's going to be a New Orleans Saint in 2024. That would be disingenuous. That'd be unfair to you. Uh, and it would make me look wild crazy if he does end up getting traded. But it certainly feels like it's inching towards him being in New Orleans and being in the black and gold in 2024. And I think 100% that's the way that it should be when it comes to Marshawn Lattimore and the New Orleans Saints. So we'll see how this continues to progress. But as of right now, the tone just continues to get lighter and lighter on Marshawn Lattimore. And that's good news for you if you want Marshawn Lattimore staying here in New Orleans. We'll see how it all ends up. But it certainly feels like it's going towards, leaning towards the idea of him sticking around here, at least for 2024. Coming up next, uh, are the New Orleans Saints getting closer and closer to right when it comes to the salary cap? And what exactly is their version of right? We got that coming up for you with more comments from Mickey Loomis, courtesy of our good friend John Hendricks from over at the uh, the league meetings. We got that coming up for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by friends at Game Time. If you're like me, you like to be spontaneous sometimes. You want to go to a game on the last second notice, or maybe you just learned that there's some theater show or comedian or comedy, you know, performance or, or, or anything like that, you know, some live event that's going on and you're like, I want to go and do that. I want to go and see that. Well, now you don't have to plan months in advance. Thanks to our friends over at Game Time who give you deals all the way up to the event beginning and even sometimes beyond, right? Sometimes an hour after the event has already begun. You can actually see your seats before you buy them. So it just completely gives you transparency over your ticket purchasing process. So if you want to, 
Take all the guesswork out of buying tickets today with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On for twenty dollars off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and use the promo code Locked On L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. All. All right, family, sure feels like the New Orleans Saints are getting very confident about their standing with the salary cap, but it's all going to come down to one specific thing before they can really, really feel good about where they are there. And it's not about the dollar sign. We appreciate you very much for being here for another episode of Locked on Saints. We appreciate you very much making us your first listen. For your second listen, hey, I know you're tired of it, sitting through Fox Sports and ESPN and having to turn your volume down because they're just sitting there yelling and arguing and shouting at one another. You want to hear what's going on from your favorite team with people that actually cover your favorite teams. There's no better example than Zion Williamson and the New Orleans Pelicans right now. The content that you're getting from Locked On Pelicans versus what you're getting nationally, mad different. And I'll tell you, one of them is right and one of them is wrong. So if you want to go and check out more from the people that know the teams best, you can find that all right here on the Locked On Podcast Network. You can find it on Locked On Sports today as we roll through all the biggest stories of the day every single day in our 24-7 national sports live stream, the first of its kind on YouTube. You can also find it over on the free uh, uh, Fire TV channels app. I almost, I almost said something different. Fire TV channels app. Go and find it today. All right. So um, are the New Orleans Saints getting closer to right when it comes to the salary cap. And so when I say right, I'm not saying underneath the salary cap, right? They're in a situation here to where they're under the salary cap. It's probably about $10 million, just under $10 million or so for them left to spend, according to Kat Terrell over at ESPN. And one of the things that you have to look at when it comes to New Orleans, though, is not just where are they right now, but where are they in terms of measuring up for their future? Now, they're already set to be like $60 million over the salary cap next year, but pish posh on that because we don't even know what the salary cap's going to be next season. So we got to wait and see what that's actually going to end up looking like. But $60 million over the salary cap, better than 80, better than 100, better than 110, right? So the Saints are inching better to where they want to be. Now, there's a, there's a difference here, right? Where some teams want to be is compliant, right? They want to be under the salary cap for next year. The Saints are not going to operate that way. They're always going to want to operate probably 20, 30, 40 million dollars over the salary cap for the next year because that's giving them 20, 30, 40 million dollars to spend in this season. It all kind of accounts back to one another. You're borrowing from future years to do stuff like sign Chase Young and sign Willie Gay and all these other guys uh, over the course of the past few years that you've seen sign Derek Carr, sign Tyron Matthew, sign Jairus Bird. Remember how great that went? I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Don't hit me. Don't hit me. Don't call the cops. I'm just playing. I'm just joking. This is not assault. I swear to you. Uh, But it's assault on your ears just saying that name. And I apologize for that. Uh, no, but you, you get what I'm saying, though, is that like their their version of right by the salary cap is very different than other teams versions of right by the salary cap. So I want to play this clip here. John Hendricks, uh, my good friend from over at Saints News Network and also our show together over on Second and Saints, uh, asked a little bit about the moves that the team made to keep Demario Davis for another year as well as Tyron Matthew for another year. And you could hear Mickey Loomis kind of acknowledge how important it is from the player perspective, but also really kind of got into why it's important from the salary cap perspective, and I'll give you a little bit of insight on that. Here's what Mickey had to say. Important because A, of our cap situation, and B, because we're trying to, you know, we're trying to manage all this together. Um, it allows us to, you know, keep our group together, allows us to manage our way out of the cap situation and remain competitive. And so- So definitely spent a little bit more time talking about the salary cap than he spent talking about the actual contributions of uh, Demario Davis and Tyra Matthew. But that's okay. We know the contributions of Demario Davis and Tyra Matthew. You're going to hear a little bit of a nod to to Demario Davis here in a little bit when it comes to Willie Gay's impact. Uh, But the thing I wanted to highlight here was how much he kind of focused on the salary cap. Now, he was asked a salary cap, a couple of salary cap questions earlier and things like that that he kind of discussed. But the thing that I really took away from this part of the conversation was around how like, this is all very helpful. Like all of these things are, are helping a ton. And so it just kind of got me to wondering like, what does being right by the salary cap look like for the New Orleans Saints? And I think that like, you're still gonna see them tens of millions of dollars over the salary cap on a year by year basis, but they're balancing it in such a way that they've like started to come back from that COVID loss, right? The COVID drop in salary cap and all those other things. 
And so being clear of that now, as they begin to move forward, you're going to see them be a little bit less and less under the salary cap on a year by year basis, looking to the year ahead. However, they will still be under the salary cap by a considerable portion. They will probably still be very much in the lead in terms of being over the salary cap. But I have to tell you right away, you should not care. You should not care as long as one thing is happening. As long as this team finds a way to win, this is going to be the key, right? If the team continues to miss the playoffs, if the team goes back to being a, a seven and 10 team or an eight and nine team, if they go back to having a losing record, if they go to missing the playoffs for what would that be a fourth year in a row now, if they miss the playoffs in 2024, then it doesn't, then it's not working, right? It's not helping. And then in that case, like at that point, if you're just putting this together and you're pushing money down the road, but you're still putting up losing seasons, then yeah, it's, it's time to reset, right? Like it's time. And I don't mean reset, like, trash everything and start back over. There's different versions of that that you can do for on a yearly process and all these other things. The Miami Dolphins did this recently, right? They reset their salary cap and then they ended up right back into an actual version of cap belts where they had to like shed a bunch of talent and all that other stuff. But you can see the way that sometimes teams will like shed salary cap spending while also still maintaining a team and maintaining a roster that can compete while also still adding talent and things like that. You just have to be very selective about how you add talent. Like, I don't think that the Saints were, in active in, were as active in free agency this offseason as they might have wanted to actually be, right? Like, we were coming into this offseason going, look, y'all, it's not going to be very active. It's not going to be big. And look, they still walked away with a splash signing. We said on this show over and over again that, like, it's likely that there's going to be, like, one splash signing or something like that. And so they bring Chase Young in. They do it in a very crafty and specific and innovative way and all while we're watching, you know, Kai Harley put up a hundred every time that he negotiates a contract, like I said last week. But I do think that the biggest takeaway of all this for me though, is that like the Saints now have a new way that they're dealing with their salary cap, right? Like they're exchanging, hey, here's an extra year for us to reduce your salary in 2024, right? So we'll give you an extra year. You come back in 2025, you're guaranteed some money there all those other things you're guaranteed that year, blah, blah, blah. Um, just let us reduce the salary here in 2024. And what that's doing is that it's allowing them to not have to restructure contracts and then push amounts of money all the way down the road. There's still a bit of a restructure element to it. There will still be dead money after those players leave and things like that. However, they're not putting themselves in a situation to where you're just kicking and kicking and kicking and kicking six, seven different times you know, over the course of the offseason. You saw a healthy blend of Shedding salary cap, not over committing salary cap to players that were on expiring contracts. Uh, Michael Thomas, uh, Jameis Winston, Andrus Pete, all sort of having like really unique dissolving contracts that like by procedure are releases, but were previously agreed upon in situations, voiding and things like that. Like a little bit of a tricky line to walk. So you saw that. You saw the Saints not re-sign players that they knew were going to get better value elsewhere. Zach Bond was going to get an opportunity at a blunt much larger role in philly um isaac adams going to get a much larger role in san francisco those were roles that the saints did not have to offer and therefore were not going to compete to pay against so you saw the sort of pragmatic spending in that way and then you saw some of the usual standard restructures but then you saw sort of these like for lack of better terms they're not really pay cuts but sort of these like reductions in salary in 2024 in exchange for something else the following year, they did that with Tyron. They did it with Demario. They did like a version of it with James Hurst. And so there's some interesting things that are going on where the Saints are just finding new ways to kind of, you know, function and, and, and find a way to make sure that they're bringing back talent, that they're maintaining their core, they're maintaining players that are important to their culture, that are important to their performance on the field, particularly on the defensive side. And they're doing so in such a way that's also helping them on the salary cap side. And that is exactly where the New Orleans Saints need to be right now. I'm very, 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 very interested, very excited to see if the Saints have a winning season in 2024, if they manage to get to the playoffs in 2024, which we'll see how that impacts their offseason going into 2025. When you've got spending, you've got capital, you've got momentum. What do all those things look like in this new version of the New Orleans Saints? We'll find out if we're ever going to find out. Coming up next, Willie Gay. The New Orleans Saints linebacker, will he have a larger impact than Chase Young in his first year in New Orleans? We got that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked on Saints. Put a Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints is brought to you by friends at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. 
Ross Jackson's number one sports book, Locked On's number one sports book, and your number one sports book. It's the only place you need to go. It's the only place that I go when it comes to putting down all these bets, especially right now in March. I love having sort of that like extra sort of oomph when it comes to watching college basketball in March. It's already so much fun, and FanDuel just makes it even more fun. And right now, they make it fun because you can say goodbye to all the busted brackets. You already know your bracket's busted. It's already gone. We all know. All of ours are dead. It's okay. Uh, So head over to FanDuel where you can bet on every game in the tournament, whether you're betting on a big upset or the number one seed. Go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. And right now is a great time to do it because new customers are going to get $200 in bonus bets on their first $5 bet. That's $200 you can then turn around and spend on point spreads money lines. You can even bet on who's going to win it all. Just head over to FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Let's get it, Houdad Nation. The New Orleans Saints signing of Willie Gay could have a bigger impact than we expect, not just because of what he might be able to do on the field, but how he can help to develop the guys that are already ahead of him and potentially behind him as well. This might be a very underrated signing for the New Orleans Saints, as we speculated when the signing happened. And could he potentially have a larger impact than Chase Young in his first year? Well, there's an argument to be made about exactly that. We appreciate you very much for being here. Don't forget, we are your team every day. Coming up on Wednesday, I believe we're going to be hearing from Dennis Allen at the uh, league meeting uh, later at some point today or something like that, like in the next couple of days, whatever. As soon as we do, I'll make sure that we've got some sound bites for you from that as well, courtesy of John Hendricks over at Saints News Network and Second on Saint, Second and Saints. Uh, but uh, we're going to dive through all that. And and I think maybe we'll get a little bit more kind of, you know, Denny, DA tends to be a little bit more transparent. Curious to see what he's got to say about guys like Marshawn Lattimore and stuff like that. So uh, as we look at, and of course, Chase Young as well, which I'll, I'll, one of the other big things that came from this was that like clearly Mickey Loomis was feeling very good about where the Saints were and how they did their evaluations and what they learned about Chase Young and the injury. Didn't feel like the neck injury really impacted him at all in 2023. And so this will be something that just kind of helps him more than anything else in 2024. So we'll see how it ends up going. But uh, it seems like there's a lot of optimism there, which you would expect, right, from a team that made the decision that the Saints made. For better or for worse, we'll find out. But not so bad so far. Uh, so the thing that I want to look at next is Willie Gay. Um, you know, John asked Mickey uh, about, you know, Willie Gay and, you know, what they're expecting from him and everything. And the thing that I liked about what Mickey Loomis had to say about him is that he kind of gave you a little bit of insight into what they're expecting for Willie Gay right off the bat. In the answer that I'm about to play for you, you're going to hear about how he expects him to push guys ahead of him, how he, how many snaps he's in line for, and what kind of role he's expected to play as well. Here's what Mickey had to say. Yeah, listen, he's a, he's a good player. I think, I think there's, he's, he's going to push our guys. He's going to be competing. He's going to you know, have an opportunity to play a lot of downs for us. And, uh, you know, particularly with Zach Bond uh, moving on to another team, you know, we need we had a need there. And so we've got, again, we've got, we've got a group of guys that we like. Um, and, and uh, you know, led by DeMario. And so... Say that was that was a good addition. Well, hello to your new strong side linebacker here in New Orleans, right? That kind of gave you a pretty good understanding of what it is the New Orleans Saints at least initial vision is for him. We'll see what happens once you get in the training camp and they get an opportunity to see him and all these other things. Like obviously things can change when it comes to that, but it seems like the early indications for what or you know the impact that Willie Gay is going to have from his personal input, like what he's going to do on the field, is that a According to Mickey Loomis, he's in line for a lot of snaps in 2024, so he should be in a situation to where he's on the field very often. So that means, of course, being in those three linebacker packages. But as we know, Saints don't play a whole bunch of those, right? They don't play a bunch of those three linebacker sets. And so then there's got to be some other way that he's getting out on the field that ends up allowing them to be able to say, hey, he's going to get a lot of snaps. So it's going to be very interesting to see exactly where he shifts in on things like, you know, dime coverage, uh, dime packages where you've got six DBs, one you know, linebacker and, you know, four defensive uh, defensive linemen, or you've got, you know, three defensive linemen, two linebackers and six DBs. It could be any way, uh, but as long as it's got six DBs, six DBs is what makes it a dime coverage package. But then you look at the nickel packages where you've got five DBs, get it five, five cents a nickel. Um, 
you have five DBs, two linebackers, and then three or, or four rather down linemen. And in those cases, is Willie Gay coming on the field in those situations? Is he on the field on some third downs? I mean, with four four six speed, yeah, you'd like to have him in coverage, right? I mean, he was a quintessential coverage weak side linebacker coming into the league. But don't forget that when he got to Kansas City, Kansas City said, no, no, fam, we want you playing on the strong side. And so I had him playing sort of that more on-ball strong side linebacker role to where he was rushing the passer and where he was getting involved in the run game. Now, here's why this is important. He mentioned as well, Mickey Loomis, that once Zach Bond signed with another team that the Saints had a need there. So that's linebacker depth need, maybe some special teams conversation could be had there. But really, I think what you're hearing there is, hey, the role that Zach Bond played in the defense, probably particularly late in the season, is something that maybe they see Willie Gay doing. And if you're going to give me the opportunity to see Willie Gay in his 446 speed rushing the passer, what have we said for a long time here on the show? that the Saints need to add speed to their pass rush. They got a little bit of it with Chase Young for sure, but now you add in Willie Gay as somebody that could potentially contribute to that from the second level. Hallelujah. Hello. Here we are. That's what we've been waiting for. So that's a really, really good indicator of potentially what it is, potentially, potentially, what it is that the New Orleans Saints see with Willie Gay. The other thing that I think that it helps you with is that as you're playing more of those wide zone offenses and things like that, which Dennis Allen's defense has held up well against, uh, you want speed. You want to be able to get to the perimeter. You want to be able to track down some of those outside zone runs, things like that. And then you add on the mobile quarterback and all of a sudden Willie Gay Chase Young, these guys end up having an impact for you. But the thing that's going to be really interesting is who has the bigger impact, right? Is Chase Young enough of getting enough pass rushing opportunities? Is he productive enough as a pass rusher in this New Orleans Saints system that he gets, you know, nine, 10 sacks? Or are we talking about a situation where he ends up with a handful right? A modest amount, a a good respectable amount. But then Willie Gay has the overall larger impact because of what he does on, I don't know if he's going to play on special teams, but let's just, we'll throw special teams in there as a potential. But what he does at strong side, what he does at weak side, what he does in coverage, what he does against the run and what he does against rushing the pass. Like there's an argument to be made that Willie Gay just has more avenues to have a larger impact potentially than Chase Young. The thing about it is that Chase Young plays a premier position, one of the most important positions in football, right? Your most important positions are the quarterback, the guy that protects the quarterback, and the guy that tries to hit the quarterback. And Chase Young's right there at number three, the guy that tries to hit the quarterback. And you might even flip that the guy who tries to hit the quarterback or get after the quarterback is more important than the guy that protects the quarterback, although they feed into each other's importance. In case you're wondering, my opinion is that after that, the guy that catches the football, obviously, is the next big thing. That's why wide receivers considered a prime or premier position in the NFL. So you think about all that. We'll have to see, but there's a chance that Willie Gay ends up having a more, if nothing else, a more expansive impact, right? In more areas of the game uh, than Chase Young, but we'll see how it all pans out. The other thing that's really interesting to me is the idea that he could potentially be pushing guys like Demario Davis and Pete Werner. And that's not about pushing them for their spots or pushing them for playing time, but it's about development, right? Like, does it make Demario Davis, does it make Pete Werner like aware that like, oh, there's somebody new here. There's somebody over there and everything. And it's funny because Willie Gay was in that same situation in Kansas City when they brought Andrew Tranquil over there. So gives you a little bit of insight in terms of like how it is that he ends up having an impact. So if his presence ends up forcing an even better game out of Demario Davis, ends up forcing an even better level of game out of Pete Werner, that's Willie Gay's impact as well. So that could be really interesting. But we can see the same thing from Chase Young with Cam Jordan with Carl Granderson, with, with some of the other younger guys like Peyton Turner and, uh, and uh, 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 Isaiah Foskey. Like I would probably put them above anybody else. So the guys that are like looking and going, oh, snap, somebody's new here. And we got to, we got to, you know, it lights the fire, right? And so there's a real opportunity for both of those guys to have that same kind of impact. But I'm very curious about whether or not Willie Gay is going to happen. What I do know is that Willie Gay will be an underrated signing because of how much he will contribute in 2024. And he's going to be one of those signings that we're going to look back on and go, I can't believe the Saints got him for that. And then you're hoping that he resigns in 2025, assuming that he stays healthy, of course, but in line to have a big impact in his first year here in New Orleans. All right, y'all. Thank you very much for making Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget for your second listen, make sure you go and check out Locked on LSU. Caroline Fenton just posted a new episode, the star-studded recruiting class of LSU. You're going to want to dig into that. 
And then, of course, the New Orleans Pelicans about to be in for a big time homestand. If you want to be caught up on all of that, Jake Madison over at Locked on Pels has you covered. We appreciate you very much, as always, for making Locked on Saints a part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, please say hi. If you need anything else around your New Orleans Saints in between these episodes, make sure you follow me on your favorite social media at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how you're momming them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.